If you've taken a DNA test and discovered Scottish ancestry, who were your earliest ancestors there? The answer isn't as simple as Celtic. Your Scottish roots likely trace back to at least four distinct ancient populations, each with their own fascinating story. Even before the complexities of later centuries emerged, these foundational groups set the stage for the cultural, linguistic and genetic diversity that still marks Scotland today. Scotland's earliest inhabitants, hunter-gatherers, journeyed from the south at the close of the last Ice Age, around 12,000 BC. The glaciers that once covered much of the region had receded, leaving behind a milder, though still challenging, environment. Yet these Mesolithic people were remarkably resourceful. Their eyes gleamed blue or green. From archaeological remains, we know their diets revolved around fish, shellfish, and whatever wild game they could track, a testament to their skill in this ancient landscape. They settled along coasts and riverbanks, leaving behind traces such as shell middens, flint tools, and the occasional fire hearth. These finds remind us of a time when groups moved seasonally in pursuit of changing resources, carrying their belongings on their backs, and building temporary shelters from driftwood and animal hides. As we peer back into this distant world, we realise that these first settlers carry the genetic heritage we now classify as Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. Encoded in their DNA are clues not only to their appearance, but to their robust builds and hardy constitutions. Despite the passage of millennia, Remnants of their genetic makeup remain in the cells of many modern Scots, though time has diluted that inheritance in a dance of admixture and migration. The relationship between these early hunter-gatherers and their dogs adds yet another layer to the story. Dogs, still largely undomesticated by modern standards, travel alongside their human companions in search of fresh streams and fertile hunting grounds. Over the centuries, this period lays the foundation for a deep kinship between people and animals that would continue throughout Scottish history. One can imagine the bond formed in the damp forests and on mist-wreathed beaches, where canines and humans relied on each other to detect potential dangers or locate elusive prey. Thousands of years roll by, and a new chapter begins around 4000 BC. Scots found themselves at the cusp of the Neolithic transition, when waves of incoming farmers from continental Europe reached the shores of Scotland carrying the genetic signature of early European farmers. To the observant eye, the coastline may look similar, but the society taking root here has changed profoundly. These newcomers bring with them seeds and domesticated animals, and they sow the concept of settled agriculture into soil, once used only by nomadic bands. Their presence is evident in stone circles, passage tombs, and the remains of early farming communities scattered across the land. A famous example of such a settlement is Orkney's Knapp of Hauer, thought to be one of the oldest preserved stone houses in northern Europe. By examining structures like these, archaeologists piece together how early farmers lived, worshipped and passed on their knowledge. With time, this Neolithic population absorbs and interacts with the descendants of the earlier hunter-gatherers. Their shared genes become woven together, producing a subtle, region-specific tapestry. Indeed, the genetic record tells us that while some parts of Britain show almost no trace of local Mesolithic ancestry, Scotland's populations exhibit a greater degree of mixing between these two ancient lineages. This detail points to the deep foothold Mesolithic groups had in this rugged territory, where they were never fully eclipsed by the wave of new arrivals. Moreover, the long coastlines and mountainous interiors made for a complex pattern of settlement which allowed diverse communities to retain and blend their cultural traditions. In the centuries that follow, the seeds of agriculture thrive, and the population grows. Stone monuments testify to ritual and social development. Communities are no longer defined solely by the pursuit of game. Iconic structures like the chambered cairns of Orkney or the standing stones of Lewis showcase the spiritual and communal lives of these Neolithic peoples. Yet the story in Scotland, as across all of Britain, does not stand still. By around 2400 BC, a new phenomenon sweeps in from the continent, the Bell Beaker culture crossing the English Channel and pushing into the farther reaches of the island. We can imagine an influx of people bearing distinctive bell-shaped pots and advanced metalworking techniques. These individuals carry a genetic component that has come to be associated with the Pontic Caspian Steppe. The effect of this migration is dramatic, often described as a near-complete replacement of up to 90% of the preceding Neolithic gene pool across Britain. For the communities in Scotland, this upheaval would have felt both transformative and startling. Archaeological excavations show burial sites with the classic beaker pottery, 
and radiocarbon dating lines up with the evidence of genetic turnover. At the genetic level, the bell beaker influx introduced haplogroups connected with step lineages. In men, certain branches of Y chromosome haplogroup R1b, especially subclades that trace their origins to the Pontic Caspian regions, began to dominate, overtaking older lineages in the process. The skeletal remains of beaker associated individuals show genetic affinities with Central European populations, underlining how people, and not just ideas, travelled great distances to reshape Britain. While new ways of life took hold, so did new family lines. Scotland's genetic tapestry, already a blend of Western hunter-gatherers and early European farmers, now included a substantial dose of steppe-derived ancestry, altering the course of its population history forever. These steppe-derived newcomers brought burial practices that sometimes focused on individual graves, rather than the collective chamber tombs of earlier eras, reflecting shifting cultural views on the afterlife and personal status. Then, as the centuries drift toward the first millennium BC, the region enters the Iron Age. By around 300 BC, tribal confederations in Britain crystallise into various Celtic-speaking peoples, each with their own cultural identities, mythologies and social structures. Scotland, a land of northern extremes, becomes home to the ancestors of the Picts, the Gaels and the Britons, groups that often share linguistic similarities but develop unique customs over time. The Picts, in particular, remain an enduring subject of fascination. Although the Romans leave written accounts alluding to the fierce tribes north of Hadrian's Wall, solid historical records are fragmentary. Genetics, however, offers a more durable footprint. Patterns in ancient DNA suggest that Iron Age populations in Scotland show continuity from the Bronze Age, but also reflect smaller scale inputs from neighbouring regions in Britain and beyond. This continuity implies that the Beaker period's genetic foundation remained influential well into the Iron Age, setting the stage for the cultural identities emerging over the next several centuries. When Rome finally marches into Scotland around 124 AD, establishing forts and lines of defence, the genetic impact is less than might be expected for an empire of such renown. Over much of Britain, Roman occupation lasts centuries, creating towns and networks that attract traders, soldiers and administrators from across the empire. Yet in Scotland, Rome's hold never fully consolidates, and its structures eventually recede. As a result, the gene pool of local groups remains largely shaped by earlier patterns. Perhaps a few individuals of Mediterranean or Near Eastern origin settled and started families, injecting a hint of diversity into the local lines. But the Roman footprint is subtle at best, in the following centuries, as the empire wanes, Britain's story fragments into various kingdoms and tribal lands, each forging its own path. While the Romans built the Antonine Wall and had military outposts that temporarily expanded their reach, the severe landscape and fierce local resistance limited how deeply Roman culture and genes permeated the northern territories. Against this backdrop, the early medieval period emerges, spanning roughly from 300 to 900 AD. Here, Scotland's identity starts to take more distinct shapes. The Picts, once mysterious to later historians, are better understood today thanks to ancient DNA extracted from their remains. Recent genetic studies reveal that Pictish populations show a continuity with the broader Iron Age gene pool in Britain, although they also exhibit some internal differences. In particular, those living in Orkney, known as Orcadian Picts, stand out genetically from their contemporaries on the mainland. This hints at smaller scale isolation or founder effects in the islands, and it reminds us that even within the patchwork of Celtic speaking cultures, local distinctions remained strong. The Pictish language, long debated by scholars, may have shared features with other Celtic tongues, although the exact nature of that linguistic connection continues to provoke research and speculation. Meanwhile, from the west comes the Gaelic migration, centered on the kingdom of Dalriata. Men and women carrying Gaelic language and customs settle along the coasts and islands of what is now Western Scotland, eventually merging with or supplanting local rulers. Over time, Gaelic culture grows in influence, seeding the linguistic and cultural bedrock of the Scottish Highlands. Y chromosome haplogroups, such as R1b L21, become commonplace, reflecting historical migrations of Celtic-speaking groups into the region. On the maternal side, lineages like mtDNA H, U and K remain prevalent, reflecting layers of ancestry that stretch back to the Mesolithic, Neolithic, and later migrations. From these gales, 
the Scots language and identity begin to crystallise, eventually merging with or overshadowing the Pictish realms in many areas. Still, local traditions sometimes blended, contributing to the intricate mosaic that would define medieval Scotland. Then, near the dawn of the Viking Age, around 800 AD, Scandinavia's seafaring warriors push their longships across the North Sea. Scotland becomes a prime target, particularly its northern and western islands, from Orkney and Shetland to the Hebrides, the genetic signature of these Vikings, often linked with certain subgroups of Y-chromosome haplogroups I1 and R1a, begins to surface in local Scottish populations. Norse settlement is not just a matter of men with swords. Women, children and entire communities sometimes follow. In Orkney and Shetland, the genetic legacy of these Norse settlers is profound. Modern studies estimate that nearly half the ancestry of Shetland residents can be traced back to Scandinavia, with Orkney following close behind. The mixture is balanced between male and female contributions, suggesting that entire families, and not merely warrior bands, made the journey and established roots in these islands. This Norse influence reshapes local politics, economics and cultural practices in ways that endure for centuries. Many islanders began speaking a Norse language, later evolving into Norn, which lingered in Shetland and Orkney well into the early modern period. In terms of day-to-day -day life, families of mixed Celtic and Norse heritage would have adopted elements from both worlds, as seen in archaeological finds, such as jewellery, tools, and inscribed stones blending native motifs with Scandinavian designs. Over time, the integration of these different peoples created pockets of strong Norse influence, visible in surnames, place names, and even the distinctive accent of island communities today. The result of these layered migrations is a genetic mosaic that continues to shape Scotland's population even into the present day. Whether examining an Orcadian fisherman or a Highland crofter, one might uncover deep paternal lines descending from steppe herders, maternal lines tracing back to early farmers who built stone monuments, and echoes of the western hunter-gatherers who fished these coasts millennia ago. Added to this is the Gaelic inheritance of the High Middle Ages and the enduring Norse footprint in Northern Islands. Each genetic signature tells its own story, bridging the gaps left by incomplete historical records. In certain remote areas, pockets of population might retain a slightly higher percentage of Mesolithic ancestry, while other locales more closely mirror the legacy of later arrivals. In border regions, subtle traces of Anglo-Saxon or even Norman lineages can appear, further emphasising that Scotland's story is woven from countless threads. Fast forward to the modern era, and the tools of genetic science have become sophisticated enough to map Scotland's history with striking clarity. Meanwhile, maternal mtDNA lineages offer a parallel record, albeit one often more stable due to the different ways in which families and cultures pass on heritage. Haplogroup H, common throughout Europe, is well represented, as are subclades of U, which can hark back to the earliest hunter-gatherers of the Mesolithic. In some parts of Scotland, particularly the islands, Haplogroup Warshuns, commonly connected with Scandinavia, provides a direct link to Viking forebears. While the specific percentages vary across families and locations, modern DNA tests have enabled thousands of people to discover these hidden facets of their ancestry, igniting fresh interest in histories once confined to local lore or dusty archives. Imagine looking at a detailed genetic map of modern Scotland today. The patterns might reveal a heavier Scandinavian component in Orkney or Shetland, noticeable Gaelic signatures in Argyll, and pockets of older lineages surviving in certain coastal or island communities. You might see a reflection of ancient ties with Ireland in western regions, or faint glimpses of shared ancestry with the Anglo-Saxon lineages of northern England in the border regions. The resulting mosaic underscores that national or cultural labels can only capture part of the larger, fluid tapestry. Over generations, families have moved, intermarried, and carried with them threads of genetic memory that tie the story of Scotland to wider human narratives across Europe. Even major historical events like the Highland Clearances, which uprooted entire communities in the 18th and 19th centuries, play into how family lines spread, shaping the geographic distribution of Scottish ancestry in places as distant as Canada, Australia and New Zealand. For many people with Scottish roots, modern genetic testing can offer revelations about deep ancestry. Some might find a paternal line that emerges from the Bronze Age steppe expansion, while their maternal line traces back to the ancient farmer populations of southwestern Europe. Others might discover surprising Viking influences they never suspected, 
or a scattering of more recent introductions from across the globe. The truth is that, while the broad strokes of Scotland's genetic past are now clearer than ever, each individual family story is unique, shaped by centuries of marriages, migrations and chance events. Where old written records fade, DNA can sometimes pick up the thread. In some cases, genealogical research may connect modern families to a single historic figure, unearthing a tangible link that makes the broader saga of Scotland's past feel far more personal. Even with the best science at our disposal, mysteries persist. The Picts, despite increasing understanding gleaned from a few precious genomes, remain a subject of debate regarding language and cultural identity. The Gaelic migrations, while historically documented, still prompt questions about the precise scale and the mechanisms by which Gaelic came to dominate large swathes of the highlands. Nor is the Viking story entirely settled. We know they left a substantial imprint, but the nuance of how these Norse communities integrated with local populations remains a fertile field for discovery. Ongoing research on ancient skeletal remains and advanced sequencing techniques could reveal further subtleties, such as episodes of epidemic disease or micro-migrations from lesser-known groups. Furthermore, the medieval period introduced yet another wave of population shifts, influence from the Normans, the Flemish, and others who came at the behest of Scottish kings looking to strengthen their realms. While these groups likely represented a smaller proportion of the total population, they too left genetic traces, especially in the East and the Lowlands. As Scotland progressed into the High Middle Ages and beyond, trade, alliance and conflict with England and continental Europe continually shaped the gene pool in quieter but no less significant ways. Traces of these later migrations show up in certain Y-chromosome, or mtDNA haplogroups, that connect modern Scots to medieval knights, merchants or settlers whose names are remembered only in dusty rolls of old charters. One might stumble upon a family crest with a Flemish motto or discover an ancestral link to a Norman noble who once ruled a swath of the borders, thereby adding an unexpected layer to a personal heritage. Yet despite the centuries of change, we can still trace lines back to the small groups of hunter-gatherers who tiptoed along those desolate Scottish beaches, scanning the horizon for seals, or scanning the forests for deer. Some shards of their genetic legacy remain, reminding us that modern identity is rooted in a distant past, even today, some families may carry old Gaelic place names as part of their surname, or recall a time when Old Norse dialects lingered in island communities. Ultimately, the fascination with Scottish ancestry endures because it unites the ancient and the modern, the known and the undiscovered, in a single, continuous thread. After all, the story of Scotland's people is the story of adaptation, resilience and transformation, a tale that continues to unfold in the cells of every new generation, 